All right, Tom, I think we'll uh, get it underway. Um, good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, I, I would just like to start with the uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, Ottawa is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. Peoples of uh, the Algonquin Anishinaabe uh, nation have lived on this uh, territory for millennia and we honor them and this land. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Chio also honors all First Nations, Inuit and uh, Métis peoples and uh, their valuable past, present and future contributions to this land. Uh, and of course, uh, in the context of uh, recent events, obviously we, this is a, a very important uh, gesture and makes us to consider some of uh, the issues that uh, uh, we have been challenged with uh, recently the uh, incident uh, or identification of the, the children uh, buried in unmarked graves in uh, Kamloops and uh, that work is still ongoing. Uh, the very sad situation that occurred in London and uh, it, we should really keep these things uh, close uh, in mind. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Tom Covezzi. Tom is uh, is an absolute triple threat in, in so many ways. He is uh, uh, a pediatric respirologist and a, a committed clinician. He is also uh, an outstanding uh, teacher and, uh, and researcher, and he is a full professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he has uh, been uh, the past uh, Anglophone content expert for the whole of respirology, uh, Unit 1 in the Faculty of Medicine, uh, he has uh, also served on a, a very large number of uh, national and international bodies, including being a member of the uh, WHO Working Group on Rare Diseases. He is past chair of the Ontario Thoracic Society and past chair of the Pediatric Assembly of the Canadian Thoracic Society uh, and a past examiner or chief examiner for pediatric respirology at the Royal College. Uh, uh, as uh, I suggested, he has uh, had a, a significant contribution to research, very well published. Uh, his main areas of interest are lung health and indoor air quality in Canadian Indigenous children, long-term respiratory complications of tracheoesophageal fistula and asthma. And uh, he is somebody who comes up with incredible titles for his talks, and uh, he will explain all of this to us. Uh, cruise ships, green jello, and fighter planes, a journey to determine whether SARS-CoV-2 is spread through the aerosol route. Uh, so please welcome Tom. Thank you so much, Karen, for that very kind introduction. Um, so good morning, everybody, bonjour. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're standing on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe and uh, Algonquin nations. And uh, we walk in, uh, the footsteps of their ancestors, uh, Kitchen Meat Wedge. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. There we are. So, um, this should now be running. There we are. So the objectives this morning are to develop a basic understanding of aerosol dynamics, understand the importance of ventilation in reducing contaminants in indoor air, uh, recognize the importance of distance in determining the transmissibility of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, and understand why uh, common infection control measures uh, help reduce the spread of COVID-19. And I really don't have any conflicts other than I'm not really much of a fan of green jello. Now, at this point, traditionally in uh, COVID-19 talks, uh, people uh, list off a whole series of statistics uh, about the, the pandemic. Um, rather than doing that, I think I'm gonna just acknowledge how much the pandemic has changed all of our lives just the fact that I'm giving uh, grand rounds instead of in a room full of my colleagues uh, via a, a Zoom meeting. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, have a moment of silence uh, to uh, remember, honor, 
uh, mourn, and if appropriate for you, uh, pray for the over 3.8 million people who have died from this awful virus. So please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about aerosol and airborne dynamics. So I'll start off by saying that airborne simply means that something is in the air. Uh, so this is the 101st Airborne Division landing on D-Day. Uh, clearly these, these, these folks were airborne, uh, but, but you can't inhale them. So, so airborne is probably a word that we should try, try to avoid using whenever possible. Uh, when we talk classically about uh, droplets and aerosols and so forth, uh, this was sort of a concept which was developed in the 1930s and 40s uh, based on some theoretical calculations, uh, early use of high-speed photography, and then droplet plates. And um, what people felt uh, at that time, and I'll just see if I can put in my pointer here, um, is that when you coughed or you sneezed, you either produce large droplets, which were more than 10 microns in diameter, and they would fall within two meters of where you were, uh, and you produced aerosols, which were less than five microns in diameter, and these could travel and stay in the air for very long distances. And this is really where all of our protocols about sort of the magic two meters comes from. We then started to learn that life is a little bit more complicated. So first of all, um, yes, aerosols, which are less than five microns, can travel these long distances and they can stay airborne indefinitely unless they're removed by air currents or dilution ventilation. But you also have aerosol particles within that two meters of where you are. In addition, those droplet particles, yes, most of them land uh, within two meters. But if you cough really hard, droplets can, can fly out and spread far more than two meters. So this gives you a little bit of a feel for what happens when people cough. Uh, once again, you will see uh, the beginning of a cough. Uh, most of the particles land, uh, the large particles land uh, close to you. And then you get these um, aerosols that travel for much longer distances and stay airborne. But you can see it's a fairly complicated process. Now to add some more complexity to this, the definition of ventilation is the introduction of outside air into a space and it dilutes and displaces indoor pollutants. So it's going to affect the spread of all of these, these size particles. Uh, in the case of um, particles that potentially contain virus, humidity and temperature are also important. Uh, increased humidity makes particles larger because they absorb water, so they settle faster. Um, different viruses either like being in human environments or dislike human environments. Uh, similarly, the temperature is higher, the particles evaporate faster, um, which means that they settle slower because the particles are, are smaller. Uh, and once again, different viruses respond either by liking um, warm temperatures or disliking them. To add even more complexity to this, uh, ver the various particles will, may settle over time. But then if you walk uh, on, on the floor, you can uh, displace these, uh, these particles and they can, they can return back into the breathing zone. And on the slide, you can see that all these little, little particles are spread fairly uniformly. Uh, real life is not like that. And uh, these, these are some, uh, some pictures of what actually happens in an airplane. And airplanes have, have great air change rates. There are 12 to 20 air changes per hour versus your house is probably about one air change per hour. Sounds really good. Uh, but within an airplane, you get all these little eddies uh, depending on uh, how um, air particles are going to bounce against people's heads and headrests and, and corridors and so forth. Um, so even though the overall ventilation in something like a plane might be very good, in a very short little area, uh, things much, may be much more complex. The next piece to think about is what happens when these particles meet you. So particles that are more than 10 microns in diameter are typically caught in the nasal passages. 
particles that are one to five micrometers in diameter uh, deposited in your airways. Uh, particles between a 0.5 and one micron can either um, deposit in your alveoli or you may just breathe them back out. So when you put this together, particles that are less than five microns are felt to be the particles that can land in your lungs. And this is often considered the respirable range. Uh, there's very good evidence, uh, for example, for influenza, that if you catch influenza virus by nasal inoculation, the typical hand to nose route, you get the flu. However, if you inhale uh, influenza virus deep into your lungs, you're much more likely to get pneumonia. Now, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, there is evidence that uh, nebulized virus will stay viable for at least the three hours that the experiment was carried out, uh, and for even 16 hours after aerosol suspension. So my interest, I guess, in, in, in uh, aerosols and, and, and COVID really began before there even was COVID. And, and we've been looking at ventilation for a very long time. Uh, we carried out studies in Nunavut, uh, showing that the mean ventilation uh, in, in about 50 houses in four communities was uh, less than the ASHRAE standards. Um, and about 80% of these houses failed to meet uh, international standards for ventilation. Uh, carbon dioxide, and, and in, your, in, in a building, uh, basically the main source of carbon dioxide are people breathing. So if carbon dioxide levels are high, that's an, indica an indication that uh, there's either too many people uh, in, the, in the room or uh, not enough ventilation or both. And uh, we showed that elevated levels of CO2 in Nunavut were associated with a higher risk of lower respiratory tract infections in two years of life, uh, as was occupancy. Uh, we then went on back in 2009 to show that installing heat recovery ventilators to improve ventilation reduced the risk of upper respiratory infections as manifested by, by rhinitis and wheezing illnesses, and as a manifestation of, of lower respiratory infections uh, in young Inuit children. Uh, I've collaborated in studies in Alaska that found similar levels of elevated CO2. And uh, we've just carried out a, a study and submitted to CMAJ, uh, looking at ventilation and CO2 in uh, four First Nations communities in the Sioux Lookout Zone in uh, Northwestern Ontario. Uh, and again, found that, that ventilation was, was likely inadequate in, in over 50% of the houses. So this is from our HRV study, showing that in the course of the winter, uh, houses that had um, uh, an, an active HRV uh, steadily had uh, improved uh, outcomes over the course of winter. Uh, actually, so the, the uh, uh, labels are the opposite. So the houses that had good ventilation had very few wheezing illnesses and the houses with bad ventilation had increasing numbers of wheezing uh, illnesses over the course of winter. So that takes us to the pandemic. Um, and as all of you recall, uh, really the first uh, data we had about how transmissible this virus came, uh, came from the Diamond Pr Princess cruise ship where an extraordinary number of people um, became sick with this virus. And when I saw this data, basically every cell in my body said, well, the only way this virus can spread so effectively all around a cruise ship must be through um, the aerosol route. This must be uh, an aerosol spread infection. Uh, I started to talk to some colleagues who um, have a research background in ventilation. I, I desperately want to start studying uh, these cruise ships and, and it didn't really get very much traction. Uh, you may recall that then there was a series of outbreaks in American aircraft carriers. And uh, for those of you who know me, me well, there's only two things on my bucket list. And one of them is flying faster than the speed of sound. So I, I desperately wanted to get onto these aircraft carriers. Um, I've got some big um, uh, connections with uh, bioterrorism uh, related aerosol research, tried to explore those routes, didn't get anywhere either. So at that point, uh, a colleague of mine who worked with me in the Sioux Lookout research, uh, Gary Malak, approached me and said, uh, well, do you have any new research ideas? And this was pretty relevant because at this time, um, everybody's houses were closed. So you couldn't really do airborne uh, indoor air quality research. 
in addition, all the First Nations and other Indigenous communities were also closed to outsiders. So you couldn't do Indigenous air quality research. And I said, boy, do I have an idea for us. And I said, we should start looking at whether COVID-19 is uh, aerosol spread. We're really good at measuring stuff in the air. And I proposed a number of rules. Uh, obviously, we had to study rooms where somebody had COVID-19 active infection. Um, in order to satisfy uh, regulators and clinicians uh, who are, are really um, uh, glued to this two meter rule, I said our samplers have to be at least two meters away from the patient. Uh, we need to measure that two meters accurately to show that we are seeing uh, spread more than two meters away from people. Um, people tend to cough and sneeze variably. So I said we should sample over a long period of time because I'm sure there are gonna be spikes in virus expulsion. Uh, I said our sampling should be done overnight to minimize uh, foot traffic in the room and the risk of resuspension of these particles. And I said, ideally I'd love to look at AGMPs happening in these rooms, but it's probably not essential. So uh, Gary Malak um, came back and had a couple more really fantastic rules added by one of uh, another colleague of ours, Ryan Kolka at Health Canada. Uh, and, and these were brilliant. He said, first of all, we need to use gentle samplers uh, to minimize the chances of the virus impacting in the sampler and disintegrating. We should use a gel cassette to catch these viruses and uh, preserve them uh, in optimal conditions. And rather than just measuring viral RNA that's floating around, we should see if this virus is culturable and therefore viable and infectious. So uh, Garrett uh, came up with uh, two samples for us to use. One is called the UPASS, uh, which uses gravimetric sampling. Uh, there's no tubes inside these things. And, and there's an inlet, uh, which is, can be sized to either capture particles less than 2.5 microns in diameter or uh, less than 10 microns in diameter. And we were planning to run this thing to sample 2,000 liters of air. Uh, the other sampler is called the Coriolis, um, and uh, it is in size selective, so there's no tiny little uh, inlets that might um, damage the virus. Um, it tends to run at a, at a higher velocity. Uh, it, it brings the virus into these cones containing viral transport medium, and it would sample about 1,900 liters of air over about 10 minutes. So uh, Gary then uh, contacted uh, a number of people at the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg, uh, Todd Coates, uh, Samantha Kasloff, and Jay Krishnan. Um, and these are the people who work in uh, high-level biosafety laboratories at the uh, National Microbiology Lab. Uh, and they're the people who could, could uh, look at the, the RNA and actually see if there is viable transmissible virus. So the project began to, to come together. Our objective was to quantify uh, the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in viable virus and aerosols, uh, more than two meters from the patient, and look at the proportion that were in less than 2.5 and less than 10 micron size fractions. Uh, this was an interdisciplinary collaboration uh, using expertise from Health Canada and Air Monitoring and National Microbiology Lab in PHAC with expertise in infectious disease. So uh, by around July, we started to get underway. We developed protocols for measuring molecular viral, viral load by quantitative PCR of um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, N gene and E proteins. We looked for, uh, we planned to look for viable virus uh, using Bureau E6 cells. Uh, and we received exemptions from REBs at Health Canada, PHAC, CHEO, TOH, and uh, Winnipeg Health Sciences Centre. Uh, the exemptions were based on the emergency nature of, of the study and the fact that we really were sampling rooms rather than patients. Uh, we didn't collect cl clinical data uh, and therefore didn't need consent. Uh, the only data we really collected is that these people had uh, COVID-19. So uh, at that point, I thought we were ready to get underway, except uh, those special gelatin filters that we need come from Germany. And like everything else last summer, COVID-19 had disrupted the supply chain. So I suggested to Gary Malak that we use green jello instead. I, I think it looks sufficiently spooky and vaguely scientific. Uh, and uh, Gary said no. Uh, 
So finally, our filters arrived from Germany around September. Uh, Todd also recruited Anand Kumar, who's an intensivist in Winnipeg, and uh, he started picking up samples for us in Winnipeg. So uh, I recruited uh, Dr. Michelin McGinty, uh, Bashur uh, Yazi, who both work at TOH to get us samples, uh, and Dr. Benoit Robert, who um, is the medical director for a number of uh, family medicine, uh, well, for a number of uh, long-term care facilities. And they were all ready to pick, us, pick vir virus samples up for us as well. Now, the problem is that someone needs to take the uh, little gelatin filters out of these samplers and ship them off to Winnipeg. And uh, you would be surprised how few people in Ottawa really wanted to remove uh, fil filters uh, containing potentially lethal virus and ship them off somewhere. So we contacted uh, the uh, viral lab at TOH, who said that they're really busy uh, picking up uh, patients with COVID-19 and they don't have time for this. We contacted everyone else we could think of in Ottawa who's ever touched a virus. Uh, and they said they're all also sa doing uh, patient samples for COVID-19. Uh, and we were kind of stuck until um, Alex McKenzie came along. Um, and I contacted Alex since he was doing groundbreaking research, looking at wastewater signals for COVID-19. And I figured, okay, if their lab is already dealing with COVID-19, maybe they can uh, do the um, processing for us. And sure enough, uh, Alex got me in touch with Lynn Kite at the CHORI, and she was able to process her samplers and send them off to Winnipeg. Now, about this time, a number of others started, started to come out. Uh, so there was a study from China uh, looking at ICUs and CCUs. Uh, very high uh, air change rates, negative pressure rooms, only looking at for RNA. And, and they found very low or, or basically non-detectable concentrations um, of viral RNA. They found a bit more in patient bathrooms and crowded malls. Uh, another study from uh, Hong Kong uh, in um, six patients, and they actually put like plastic umbrellas around these patients to try and maximize their capture of virus but they didn't find any. Uh, Santa, Santa Pia in uh, Nebraska then did two studies which were quite different. Uh, these were in a medical uh, containment center. They not only looked for RNA, but they looked for a virus by culture. And uh, they found um, that 63% of the room samples and 58% of the hallway samples um, contained RNA. They didn't grow any virus, but they found, found intact viral protein in a hallway sample. And in a similar study by the same group, they found that half of a, a total sample of six did contain a viable virus. So about this time, the WHO um, weighed in and they felt that based on, on expert opinion, um, this virus was not going to be spread by the airborne or the aerosol route. Um, and there's a lot of interest in their decision about this. And uh, we just couldn't wait to provide evidence um, to, to show otherwise. Now, some more studies started to come out. And uh, Lednicki in uh, Florida, who's one of the gurus at airborne viral sampling, uh, used a special method where uh, they actually trapped the virus in uh, sort of water uh, condensed um, materials. And, and once again, in an award and also in a car, uh, they did find a uh, viable virus. And, and this becomes interesting because after these sort of two initial studies by Santropia and Lednicki, absolutely no one else has been able to find a viable virus. So studies from Iran, from Italy, uh, from North Carolina, uh, found low levels or no, or no levels of viral RNA. Um, and even when they tried to culture virus, they weren't finding any. Uh, even more studies came out, uh, again, from all over the world, um, Korea, Singapore, Iran, the UK. Uh, these are all relatively small studies. Uh, and again, typically either all the samples were negative or, or a small minority of them, 14, 27% had viral RNA and nobody was picking up culture. There's also a, a really well done study from Quebec City uh, looking at ward negative pressure rooms uh, five air change rates. Uh, again, 27% of their samples 
uh, contained RNA, but no viable virus. So if you have a lot of not really good studies, um, the next thing that seems to happen is a systemic review of these uh, studies. So Brigand uh, published this in uh, JAMA Open. And when they put this all together, uh, they noted that overall about 17% of air samples were uh, viral RNA positive, uh, but only those first couple studies actually grew virus. Um, they found a good correlation between air and sample surface contamination, suggesting that that resuspension, people walking on floors or carpets, uh, may uh, bring virus back into um, the, the air domain. Um, and they also noted an important thing called the, the cycle threshold. And uh, the CT is basically the number of amplification cycles you need to do in the lab before you can pick up virus. And they found that you need a CT value between about 37 and 45 to even detect RNA. And um, if the CT value is more than 35, uh, the chances of you culturing virus is very low. And, and again, um, it's kind of counterintuitive. The fewer amplification cycles you need, uh, the, more the more RNA you have there. So for CT values, the smaller the number, the more RNA there is there. Uh, about this time, um, the scientific community started to, to, to really sway and uh, say that even though the evidence is still not very strong, uh, airborne transmission has got to be out there. Now, uh, then, uh, 239 scientists from 32 countries published an open letter to the WHO, and the WHO sort of flip-flopped and acknowledged that evidence was emerging of the airborne spread of COVID-19. So by um, mid-fall of uh, 2020, we'd uh, now studied about 20, 25 uh, rooms, and uh, we were all ready to show that this virus is going to be spread by the aerosol route. Uh, and we anxiously awaited the first set of uh, results coming from Todd Kutz's lab. And what we found was zilch. Uh, none of those, those specimens uh, grew virus. And Todd pointed out that even the concentrations of RNA were really, really small. They were just kind of at the level of, um, of detection. So, um, as a clinician, uh, what one traditionally does if one doesn't like the results of a lab test is you blame the lab. So I figured, okay, what must be happening is these viruses are going into our samplers. Uh, they're hitting all the various walls of these samplers before they impact on our gelatin filters and they get smushed. Uh, and then they get shipped to, uh, to Winnipeg. It takes about a day and presumably by about then, um, this virus is long since toast, and that's why we're not picking it up. So I suggested that we uh, nebulize this virus in the National Microbiology Lab, uh, have it picked up by aerosol samplers, have the samplers uh, sit around for a little while, and see if we can grow the virus uh, under these conditions. So even in, in a high-level biosafety level lab, you'd be shocked how little enthusiasm there is for, for blowing uh, a potentially lethal virus all around the lab. So, so my suggestion was not gonna happen. However, uh, Todd and Samantha were fantastic and they carried out a, a, the, the next best, the best thing, a series of validation experiments. So they took our gelatin filters and inoculated them with another virus called vesicular stomatitis virus left them to dry out for, for four to 16 hours, uh, or they placed them in our UPASS samplers for 16 hours. Uh, and after that time, they went from five logs of virus to 3.5 uh, logs of virus. So clearly under, under similar conditions, the virus was uh, viable. They then went on and, uh, at our urging and started to look at taking our gelatin those filters spiking them with actual SARS-CoV-2 virus at the kinds of concentrations reported by Ladnicki. Again, left them alone, put them in our UPASS samplers, uh, which ran for 16 hours. And they found that this virus is actually much more hardy uh, than the uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. Um, the virus survived really well under, under these conditions. <laughs> 
So at this point, uh, Dr. Ben Robert came by with another brilliant observation. He pointed out that if you think about this, these patients are symptomatic for a couple of days, then they get sick, then they get admitted to hospital, then they get sicker, then they get admitted to ICU. And maybe by the point they get to ICU, they're not really shedding virus anymore. So we decided to move from uh, sampling regular COVID wards and ICU to prioritizing uh, long-term uh, care facilities, uh, wards that were actually having an active outbreak. And at that point, the federal government uh, contacted us that there was an outbreak in the Stony Mountain um, Institution in uh, Manitoba, a correctional facility, and that we should be sampling there as well. And I'll admit, as in my career as a pediatric respirologist, I, I never thought that I would be studying um, correctional facility inmates, but, uh, but here we are. Uh, and then studies started to come out confirming exactly what, what Ben pointed out. Uh, so the mean time from symptom onset to the time you stop uh, producing culturable virus is about a week. But after that time, your immune system still kicks in, smushes up this virus. So you still exhale bits of RNA that aren't infectious, but can be picked up by samplers for an average of about a month. So a number of uh, other studies started to come out as well. Um, again, studies from, uh, from uh, China, um, from North Carolina. Uh, again, we're picking up generally small concentrations of viral RNA, not picking up any positive culture. But then the question came out, can, can the RNA at least spread further? And there was a really important study from uh, Sweden uh, where they put little petri dishes containing uh, viral transport medium uh, under the ceiling vents in patient rooms and, and all over a building containing COVID patients. Um, and, and they were finding viral RNA uh, even in uh, HEPA filters that were several stories away um, from these patients. And uh, another study came out um, uh, from Portland, Oregon, again, where they looked at air handling units so these were far, far away from these patients. And they took a combination of uh, airflow from, from patient rooms. 80% of the uh, airflow came from outside the facility. Uh, these things then went through a filter, uh, went through a fan, went through another filter, uh, went through a damper, and then went back into rooms. And 35% uh, of these uh, pre-filters, 17% uh, of the final filters, and 21% of the air damplers all contain uh, RNA. So clearly at least the RNA truly can float for very, very long distances. So uh, we looked at uh, uh, systematic reviews and a bunch of studies. We haven't looked at any animal studies. So a couple of animal studies came out as well. Uh, one study looked at uh, macaque monkeys uh, and they showed exactly what had been seen before in influenza where uh, infection through <clears throat> the aerosol route resulted in much more severe respiratory distress and lung pathology than installation of the virus in intranasally. There's also a study where they took a couple of pairs of ferrets that were caged on top of each other. They were connected by a meter of ducting with lots of, of curves. Uh, they artif artificially affected one ferret with SARS-CoV-2 and waited to see what would happen to the other part a half of the pair, and all of the recipients caught uh, COVID-19. Unfortunately, they pointed out that the ferrets have fur, and they lick the fur, and then they shake themselves. So whether the virus was really being transmitted through their ducting or by fur floating around is really not very clear. So this took us to about January. <clears throat> and by January, we decided we have enough data. Uh, it's time to analyze our results. So. Um, Todd happily uh, sent me some spreadsheets, and I discovered that spreadsheets uh, of viral lab data are completely uh, incomprehensible to me. Uh, I also learned why we should have had uh, case report forms for our researchers, because everyone coded the different rooms differently. Uh, and I think many of my, my co-researchers uh, would have fantastic backgrounds in um, uh, in code breaking because their, their codes are incomprehensible. So I needed help with these spreadsheets. And um, 
About that time, the second and third wave started happening in Winnipeg, everybody got busy. So it took a while for us to start to get strategies that we could work with. And then we brought in uh, Sophie de Nauder-Moore, who's a med student in Queens, who had the patience of deciphering uh, all of these spreadsheets and providing us data. So after cruise ships, fighter jets, green jello, wastewater, jailhouse rock, Excel purgatory, eight macaque monkeys, and four ferrets, we had results. So we had uh, samples from 99 rooms. This is the largest study of uh, aerosol COVID-19 uh, published anywhere in the world. 67% uh, of our samples came from the wards, 17% from ICU, 11% from long-term care facilities, and 6% from correctional facilities. We had about 66 samples using our UPASS 2.5 micron samplers, 52% uh, using our UPASS uh, 10 micron samplers, and 20% using these Coriolis um, sort of undifferentiated particle size samplers. So we knew that from our ICUs and wards and long-term care facilities, that there's an average of about eight uh, air changes per hour. So these were generally pretty ventilated, well ventilated rooms. And what we found um, was we found viral RNA more than two meters from patients in 10.9% of the rooms sampled. So this is pretty similar to what, what other people have found in all over the world. None of our samples grew viable virus. Again, very similar to what's been found in virtually all these other studies other than those first couple of ones. The uh, average CT of these E proteins, that's the more sensitive protein, was 33.6. So this is a small um, CT. Uh, the end protein was very similar. And the mean RNA concentration in the air of these E proteins was about 1,200 copy numbers per, per cubic meter. Uh, the highest concentration was in a long-term care facility room. So again, small cycle times. In terms of locations, we found RNA in 20% uh, of the long-term care facility rooms, 17% uh, of the ICU rooms, 12% uh, of the correctional facility rooms, and about 8% of the ward rooms. In terms of particle sizes, uh, there was no significant difference between the various part particle size samplers. Uh, as you can see in the slides, so about nine to 13% of the samplers are positive. And there's also no significant difference in the proportion of rooms in the various uh, areas that were RNA positive. We carried out a logistic uh, regression to figure out the likelihood of detecting viral RNA uh, in one of our samplers. And in a model where we included air change rates, room types, sampler types, uh, none of these were uh, significantly um, effective at um, and, and, and determine the likelihood of picking up the, or the virus. And similarly, uh, for the different room types, um, none of these were predictive of, of copy number as well. So our study has, has, a, has a number of li important limitations. Uh, we didn't assess variants of concern, which may be more transmissible and more uh, hardy than the original uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus that we looked at. Um, I still worried that maybe our samplers were, were bringing in the sampler, bringing in the virus and smushing it against the walls or the filters. But then one would think that you see lots of RNA from fragmented virus. We didn't see that. Uh, is it possible that there's a virus out there, but it's really hard to grow? And um, it's important to point out that there's not really good evidence showing that the virus has been grown from droplets or surfaces either. Uh, but there are a couple of studies that did pick up um, viable virus from fomites, uh, both in Toronto, which was probably the, the second biggest study done looking at this. It was a CHR-based uh, study, very similar um, a methodology to ours. And uh, Sanjapia, the, the guy in Nebraska, Nebraska who successfully grew virus, they grew up from virus as well. There's not a lot of data that's looked at whether virus in droplets um, is viable. And that's, I think, research that still needs to be done. I think we need to keep in mind that most of our sampling was done in places uh, with very high air change rates. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we didn't look at the effects of AGMPs, 
uh, we didn't actually measure the air change rates in the various rooms. And, and again, many of our patients may have been too far along in their disease course for us to pick up uh, exhaled viable virus. So what, putting this all together, what exactly does this mean? Um, I think we can say that more than two meters away from patients, uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA is present in very low concentrations, uh, making transmission less likely. And that's probably especially true uh, in the presence of good or probably even decent ventilation. Uh, I think it's worth keeping in mind that the window when patients are infectious is really fairly short, probably about three days before they're symptomatic and three to seven days after the symptomatic. So certainly for, for hospitals, many admit, admitted patients are going to arrive after this window. And while patients shed sort of junk RNA for a long time after that, that's probably not viable virus. Worth keeping in mind that there may be exceptions to, to, to these conclusions, especially once again with VOCs, with AGNPs, uh, perhaps super spreaders are different. And especially in places with really bad ventilation, again, the results may be different. And our study is, is published as a preprint at uh, MedRxIV. Um, if you type in Kavasi, the uh, study will come up, or Malak. Um, and uh, it's been submitted to, to PLOS One, so hopefully they'll, they'll accept it. So other things to kind of keep in mind is we did find that the viral RNA is present both in large and small particles. But again, RNA is not the same thing as transmissibility. And again, given how low our CT values were, um, it's probably fairly unlikely that the virus could be successfully cultured however you do it. But we have to keep in mind that culturing SARS-CoV-2 from environmental sources has turned out to be pretty difficult. Uh, reassuringly, our, our results are consistent with the recent CHR, studied, CHR funded study from Toronto similar methodology, and our results are really consistent with the great majority of other studies. While a few of the very early studies reported culturable virus in aerosols, uh, no one else has really been able to replicate this. And uh, despite uh, a lot of expert opinion, which suggests that aerosol transmission is the dominant form of transmission of SARS-CoV-2, um, I think this is fairly unlikely. I think in reality, um, virus can be um, uh, transmitted uh, by, by droplets, by fomites, uh, sometimes by aerosols, but it's unlikely given all this that aerosol is the, uh, is the dominant form of transmission of the virus. Um, I think the other important message from this is rather than just having expert opinion, there really is this need for, for data. And, and I think getting that data is what's really going to drive our understanding um, of this issue forward. In terms of implications for public health, uh, I think our data suggests that current public health guidelines make sense. So maintaining that physical distance, getting more than two meters away from people, wearing a mask, which reduces the spread of large and small particles to a moderate extent, uh, avoiding crowded and confined indoor spaces, um, ensuring that uh, indoor spaces are well ventilated and ideally supplemented with HEPA filters or UV lights, which kill virus where needed, and the importance of hand hygiene. So what about the future? Um, I know that the government of Canada is investing $150 million in better ventilation for schools, hospitals, and other buildings. And that's fantastic. Uh, better ventilation uh, is going to reduce the spread of this virus. And it's going to reduce uh, indoor air contamination with every other nasty thing you can think of. And I really wonder that down the road, whether um, between improved ventilation and, and uh, this, this understanding of hand hygiene, <clears throat> the concept that you need to wash your hands before you touch your no nose, mouth, and or face, whether that's gonna improve public health in the long run, <coughs> whether children are, um, are, are going to um, get sick less often. 
Uh, I've already mentioned our, our many research collaborators who have been uh, just fantastic in, in, in getting the study uh, to, to have been successfully completed. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the funding we've received from the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, and from Health Canada. Uh, and hopefully at the end of all this, um, our, our, our world will, will come back to something which resembles normal and uh, look a little bit less like this. So uh, let me stop there and uh, open things up to questions. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. That was uh, really uh, uh, excellent overview on, uh, of this area and, uh, and, and tremendous work really highlighting the complexity uh, of, uh, of doing this and, and the uh, number of uh, individuals and, and areas that we have to engage to, uh, uh, to lead to, to a successful uh, outcome with the study. Um, a question I have really relates to well, two things. One, is, it, is there other work going on at the present time that is uh, likely to um, affirm or, or support your, your conclusions uh, from, from other areas. And, and given the importance of this work, I just wonder whether or not uh, you might have pitched to a higher impact journal or go to somewhere like Lancet or, or whatever, and maybe you could comment on that. So, so both great questions, thank you. Um, there, there hasn't been very much coordination of, of this type of research. And it, it's sort of been an interesting process because um, between us, we, we all keep finding new studies that we didn't know about. Um, and, and it's been quite embarrassing to discover that there is a really similar parallel study, slightly smaller sample size than ours uh, and entirely hospital based um, happening 500 kilometers away in Toronto, uh, CIHR funded uh, that um, we didn't know about. And, and kudos to that group um, that CHR funding was available very early in the pandemic. And, and we were still kind of putting our, 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 our ducks in a row. We weren't ready to go, go after that, that funding and, and they clearly were. Um, in terms of, of uh, impact journals, we thought about this a lot. And um, I really wanted a journal that was going to publish very rapidly and, and that's kind of where we went with PLOS One. It turns out that PLOS One is not quite as quick as I thought they would be, uh, but they interestingly recommended that we, uh, we submit to, to, to a Med Archive. And um, so it's already been available. The abstract's been viewed uh, in the 12 days since we've, uh, we've posted there uh, 1800 times. And, um, and hopefully PLOS One will publish it as soon as as soon as they can hopefully okay great thank you it looks like alex is there and prime to, uh... okay, uh, hi hi i'll just get off a mute there uh, great talk tom can it be that it's just within uh, uh, uh two to seven days after you become infected you hit your peak uh, 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 sort of um uh, infectivity and only half of that will be clinically apparent because you're asymptomatic, you get your lowest CT rates, and it is within two to three feet away and droplets, that's it, full story, that basically it happens earlier than we think as far as infectivity goes, and it happens more proximal than after you get past the six feet. And when you think aerosols, it's a geometric relationship as far as volume, these large droplets will have so much more virus, and that's it, that's all as far as infectivity. Has anybody done studies such as yours from a two to three feet distance as far as um, capturing live virus? So those are great questions. I, I think that's what the data is, is, is telling us right now. Right. Um, and again, the data, there are limitations of this data, there, there are important limitations. Right. So um, it certainly needs more work, especially with the VOCs. I think the VOCs are a piece that nobody has looked at to, to date and that's important. Um, it's a little bit hard to do to get people to stand a meter away from someone who's expelling virus and having them cough into something. Um, but it, it would be reassuring data to see that. And, and a number of the studies that, that I've mentioned, um, where, where, I, where I think I think I had concerns because they were measuring 
aerosols or what they call the aerosols, one and a half meters from patients, which is more in that kind of droplet range than the aerosol range. So, and they didn't really pick up live virus either, but 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 better better data is really needed on this. And just quickly, just a final push back on the surface. I, I sent you that article where they swab surfaces 90 places in a hot zone in, in the UK in the middle of a surge. They could grow no, once again, RNA seen in 45%, no viable virus swabbing surfaces. So this idea touching the surface and into your eyes and nose, theoretically possible, but I just don't think there's evidence for that happening at any level. And I, that's just a grump of mine. And you and I can have a cage match at some point, but that's... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, great talk. Uh, Nicole? Okay, thanks, Tom. That's a, a great talk and congratulations on the research. So I think there's a couple of things. One is the CT values that are very high, that, you know, above 35 is a really high CT value. And if, even for a clinical specimen, the false positive rate, you know, for clinical specimens, you use three uh, targets, gene targets, right? Initially, they started with five, and then the sensitivity went, they looked at the sensitivity, so they, they landed on three. And of those three, there's two that are the better gene targets. So if you have a CT value of greater than 35, for even uh, for less than, than three of them, then you really have to wonder what exactly uh, you're measuring. Because I can make a CT value of 39, and it'll be negative for all intents and purposes. So I think it's worth emphasizing that the CT values for these, your average, I think your median was 30, 35 or something, right? So uh, 32 or 35. 35. Yeah. So this is this uh, tells us that the, the amount of RNA even is very, very low. And the practical application of that is that the ability to transmit, even with that kind of um, RNA, uh, that kind of RNA is probably extremely rare. Um, so that's a good point, I think, a good take home point. I guess the other thing that, that the complexity of it you alluded to, but you know, in large uh, areas such as warehouses or workplaces where the, the density of people that might be shedding virus into an environment um, really will uh, be very different depending a on the number of people the ventilation I agree um, and the whether they're wearing personal protective equipment so in the early part of the pandemic in California in Singapore and Korea when people actually didn't know about um, uh, you know uh, n95s and nobody hardly anybody was wearing any protection no, let alone regular face masks there was there was literally no transmission in ventilated patients, and even if they just use single rooms. So I think that, that, that not that we would do that now, but I think um, the fact that people went to regular surgical masks and in a well-ventilated place, such a hospital, an ICU, et cetera, the transmission has been vanishingly low. Um, so I guess I could go on and on and on, but I think your point is, if I can, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that surgical masks, well-ventilated places, and uh, greater than two meter distance goes a very, very long way to protect people from transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, I think that, 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 that's, that's a fair summary. Thank you. Fully agree. Uh, Joe? Tom, thank you very much for uh, a fantastic presentation. And again, as Kieran said, uh, kudos for getting this up and running as quickly as, as you have and mobilizing the, the colleagues that you did. Uh, I know you've uh, looked at a recent article in The Economist sort of within the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, it's unusual for anything about ventilation to ever be discussed in The Economist, but they, they talked in that article about are we being too simplistic in looking uh, is it droplet? Is it aerosol? Uh, for example, this business of what Alec McKenzie was just discussing, you know, if you're within two meters, uh, you know, it's this. And then if you're greater than two meters, it's that. It may be simplistic given that you look at, at the, the physics of super spreader events and that kind of thing. And I wondered, you know, do we need to get, uh, is it time to get to uh, a variety of new uh, uh, professionals involved to look at the physics of uh, actual uh, droplet versus aerosol, et cetera. I wondered what your take was on that uh, article. 
think uh, Gary Malak, who's one of my uh, co-first authors on the paper, really put it well that we probably have to get away from the idea of talking about droplets and aerosols, because within two meters you've got droplets and aerosols, and over two meters you've got droplets and aerosols, and really think more in terms of distance. And um, as, as Nicole said, probably most of the, the action happens in a less than two meter distance, regardless of the size of the particles. Uh, and not that much ha action happens further away. Um, and, and again, I, I, it's been funny watching how uh, various august bodies have ping ponged on this or flip flopped, going from no, it's not aerosol to yes, it's mostly aerosol, which is uh, what, what the economist said. And I think based on, on, on a fair number of studies, which all kind of agree with each other, mostly do, um, the important piece becomes that if, you, if you're more than two meters away, there, there's not a lot of virus there in general. There's likely exceptions to that, and we need to keep that in mind. Exactly as you said, the, the super spreaders and so on. Um, but probably with, with good infection control precautions and, and being farther away from people, the chances of picking up the virus is going, in general, going to be fairly small. Thank you. Chuck. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tom. Um, and uh, I think that one of the, you know, real take home messages is that it's an evolving science, right? And uh, that it, it's not as clear cut and making things that uh, are, are not meant to be black and white and to, meant to be a continuum and have exceptions and many different uh, issues uh, uh, factors related to it is, is uh, not necessarily uh, the right thing to do. Um, I'd like to kind of put, kind of frame uh, some of the things that uh, you've, you've done in your basic science into the kind of clinical and IPAC contents, uh, context. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, is important to, to understand is that we, we really don't know what an infective dose is. Although CT ratios you know, reflect number of viruses, and we do know that with you know, high viral load, there's increased transmission, uh, but it still is not known exactly what the infective dose is. The other thing, the other issue is that, um, you know, as you know, going in and out of a, a patient's room or even being in a patient's room for prolonged periods of time, People don't sit in one spot uh, only, like 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 your um, uh, your virus catcher. I'm just, I can't remember what it's called, so I'll just call it virus catcher. Uh, and so, you know, they wouldn't sit there for ten hours at, at one spot and potentially be exposed in, in same, the same way. And so, they would potentially come in and out of a two meter distance, or even a three meter distance, or whatever have you, or potentially be exposed in in such a way. And I guess the final thing is that. Uh, you know, uh, the, the science uh, is, is the science, but what, what we wanna know is, you know, how do we protect ourselves and how do we protect our patients? And in the end, um, like you're saying, the IPAC pr uh, practices have been very, very clear and, and, and very, very uh, effective in terms of protecting. And since, you know, since the end of uh, March, when we've started to institute all the, um, enhanced measures at CHEO, we've not had one uh, case of occupational uh, transmission in a, in a situation at CHEO where people were, were doing the right things or where, and wearing the right things. So that's that's a very important thing to underscore too. Thank you for those, those, those important comments. Um, and, and you're right, it, it certainly is an evolving science. science. Um, that, that's, that's the reality of this. Well, it looks like there are no more uh, questions, uh, Tom, and we are at the end of our time. Just like to thank you again for your excellent presentation and, and tremendous body of work and uh, good luck with um, where it goes to from here. And, and I think the, to the comments around the, uh, uh, the measures that we have in place, uh, strict adherence to those is obviously going to keep more and more people safe. So thanks again, excellent uh, work, and uh, we'll draw to the close. Thank you, bye everybody.